Yeah. <laughs> Don't with my Oreo. Okay, good. Um, do we really know what happened? Really the brother did. did the brother. That's what I thought too. Yeah. I mean, that seems like kind of obvious. Hey, do you just want to talk about death? death? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just murdery, 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 uh, Auld Lang Syne. Auld Lang Syne. Zine? Uh, I think it, mean, it means like An old old times or something. I don't remember. I heard about it one time. Yes, that's it. It's it's the new year. Yeah. Happy 2019. Yo, this year is going to be lit. I'm graduating this year. We are getting a place. Team Mystery. Yeah. This year. Um, True. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a good year. It's gonna be a good year. You know, I was telling somebody last night at the we went to like a New Year's party last night. It was like we're yeah, social. I, yeah, we're so social. Um, <laughs> twenty mostly with fucking Hulu and Netflix. Um, no, the the like twenty for for me from my perspective, twenty nineteen is gonna be like a lot about twenty twenty. In the like, <gasps> me too. You know, I was thinking about that. Yeah, there'd be talk about the presidential election. Everyone's all. Hyped up already about, like, who's going to be in the Democratic primary. Elizabeth Warren announced, you know, she's exploratory committee. So it's it's all, you know, it's 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 going to, I think, kind of fly by, honestly. When will Nikki run? But we're here at the beginning, so. She's she's old enough, right? Nikki Minaj? Yeah. Yeah, a girl's pushing 40. Oh, really? Yeah, she's like 37. Yeah. Not that I'm judging or anything. She looks hot as hell. So, no, maybe it's Beyonce that's pushing 40. Could be. I, I think they're about the same age. Hmm. I'm not sure. I don't know. This has nothing to do with anything. We. <laughs> oh, what? Uh, podcast well, welcome is this? to Mystery Murdery Mystery Thingy. Mystery Murdery Thingy. Mystery Murdery Thingy. Mystery, the other day, my boss was like, What's your, what's your podcast Mystery. called? I was like, Mystery Murdery Thingy. Are you embarrassed Take it of our? Seriously? Are you embarrassed of our title? I just think it's dorky, <laughs> but I like it. Well, because it because we're dorky people, and I, it also encapsulates <laughs> what we're talking about. Yes, we don't really have a set, and it's a li- it's kind of lighthearted, you know. But uh, yeah, but this is part two, right? Of, of the cold, I call it the coldest of cold cases. The coldest of cold cases, the Jean Benet Ramsey. Murder case part two, in which we get into the investigation. investigation. Yeah, we're getting better at saying things at the same time. Yes, we yes, are. we are Siamese, Siamese twins. twins. Um, so is that we are Si? Damn it! Okay. Is that a, is that a, is that like an offensive term now? Should I just say con- conjoined twins? Oh, I don't know if that's is that weird. I don't know. There were a couple of conjoined twins that got uh, successfully separated not too long ago. I used to watch stuff like that on TLC with my mom. Uh, yeah, you you also watch Pimple Poppers, so I don't trust your watching habits. Yep. <laughs> gross. There so are gross. millions of people who do the same thing. Yeah, so, well, millions uh, of people are gross. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> At least. I'm not, I'm not alone in this endeavor. <laughs> <laughs> you are not alone. My mom was like, yeah, she's just always on my TV. Do you watch that? You watch it? And I'm like, do you watch the Pimple Papa? That's yeah, that's how my mother talks. <laughs> right. I remember chocolate. Your mom's Cloris Leachman. <laughs> <laughs> ah, chocolate. Sweet, sweet chocolate. What's that from, Mario? It's from SpongeBob. Yes. I know. Yes. I know that one. We're teaching him millennials. We're teaching him. I'm an early millennial. Okay. No, you're a late millennial. Oh, no, you're an early millennial. Right. Yeah, I was going to say. Late because you're old. (laughs) That's what I was thinking. Because I'm dead. (laughs) Come on. I'm not George H.W. Bush, okay? I'm not dead. Too soon? My mom was really bitter. I mean, that was last year. My mom was super bitter about the mail that day. She was like, come on. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, it's like, what is this day of mourning bullshit? (laughs) (laughs) I like how much we're talking about your mom this episode. It's funny. We stand Mama Zot. My mom was listening to episode one of the Jean Monnet case, even though I don't I don't think she had listened to episodes before that since like the beginning. We stand Mama Silva. <laughs> okay, great. Um but you know the Jean Monnet case, I guess, you know, it could, captures everyone's attention. It's just captivates. There's so much to it, especially this insane, insane yeah. investigation. Okay, let's 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 get into it. 
All okay, right. let's go. Okay. So to give a little bit of uh, context to the sort of reason why this investigation is so cold and how it was kind of almost fated to go wrong from the very, very beginning. And and w- one of the inherent flaws in this case was the antithetical uh, and, and very, very stubborn perspectives of the DA's office, the Boulder PD, and the Ramseys. Right. So they're right. kind of these three, um, although you could say there are many more, obviously, but, but three main, you know, uh, uh, competing perspectives on the case, driving the case in different directions. And therefore, it could never have that kind of singular laser focus that a case like this demands in order yes. to solve it. There's just too many theories that they're looking at at once. And not only is it that the theories are, are disparate and, mm-hmm. and, and that they're... It's that these all these people, it seems... Um, are, at least from our perspective, more invested in being correct about their theory than, than in actually finding out the truth. Right. Um, right. Which is, I think, one of the reasons, again, why we haven't gotten the truth it's just in this a case. Bad human flaw. Yes, and it, and it is very human. Um, it's what a lot of people call confirmation bias. Okay. You know, and we'll see this when we're getting we'll 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 get into especially some of the DNA stuff, the forensics, that you know some of the investigators had a certain idea of where this investigation was supposed to go, right? Whether that's you know the police thinking that it must have been the Ramses or the DA's office thinking it must not Gotta have been be the an Ramses. Intruder. Um, right, right. Um, so th- there's this kind of like in- inherent uh, flaw that that really hampered. Um, the investigation, you know, right from the beginning. But obviously not the only thing that hampered the investigation. Um, so, Chloe, you're uh, going to talk about some of the many police mistakes that I th- yeah. started, you know, right from the beginning of the I case. think this is one of the most devastating parts of this case. It's uh-huh. the very simple mistakes that could have... It wasn't even like, oh, no, that's a mistake. It, But, like you understand that kind of mistake can happen. This right. is this is stuff that shouldn't have happened at all. Exactly. It was just a mixture of lack of experience and the fact that there weren't many officers available on over the holidays, like, mm-hmm. anyway. So nobody was even really in charge that morning. And a lot of others, a lot of, it was a lot of, a lot of silly things. So they didn't, go to the house immediately. They sent different patrol officers there instead of the detectives. Detectives didn't go until like a couple hours after Mm. the call. Um, They weren't properly equipped either. They should have had like like a tape recorder and they couldn't they couldn't really record their interviews with the Ramses, which they didn't even get till much later Mm. anyway. So if a kidnapping had occurred, which based on the 911 call, that's what Patsy said, there should has there should have been crime scene tape everywhere, not just I think it was John Monet's room. Yeah, not just her bedroom. The entire right. home should have been dusted for fingerprints. It should have been photographed. None of that happened. And then we have Linda Art. Is that how you say it? Linda mm-hmm. Art? Aren't, yeah. Aren't. She was the police officer that was left there alone by no, I think we talked about this, by no right. fault of her own. And it's kind of interesting, sorry, if I could just in, interject. For sure. L- Lin, it, Linda Arndt, her main perspective, as we know, was a, as a, a community outreach officer. Yes. She was sort of a, a liaison officer between the community and, and because, what you also have to understand about this police force, the Boulder Police Force, apart from not really, like, dealing with these cases very much and not having that large of a staff, the incoming police chief, you know, not too long before this, he was all about community policing. He was like a very early proponent of community policing, which which I think is, is great. Like, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But Linda Arndt and that perspective seem to have kind of led to some of these mistakes vis-a-vis the Ramses, like right at the crime scene. Right. Um, and another obvious one, John should have never been allowed to go off and search. Yeah. And then the body was found, and then it was moved. It should have been kept where it was. Nobody should have touched it. It was 
definitely a devastating blow to lots of probably incriminating evidence too. Mm -hmm. And another thing is that the Ramses weren't properly searched or or anything because they should have been taken in into custody like no no matter what. Um there was also uh no law enforcement op- officer um with him when he went when he found mm-hmm. his daughter's body and they couldn't like really um they couldn't look at his reaction which is kind of important. Um yeah, and like I said, they should have been the family should have been taken to the police station so they could have interviews, their clothing should have been collected. There's a lot of physical evidence that should be there that's just not. Um just a lot of crucial stuff that should have should have happened but didn't. Right. Yeah, I know exactly. Um were there any other like particular examples of po- the po- like police um I can't really think of anything else, but, you know, they, um, as this kind of case progressed though, there, there were a lot of these points of contention that, that developed, right? Right. There was no teamwork. Right. That should have been there. Every piece of evidence and every sort of test and examination seemed to just create more controversy as opposed to moving the investigation forward. It, it never seemed to move forward, even, even when there was evidence that was found or, you know, tests that were done. Um, And I just kind of wanted to go through, like, all of the many, many, and this isn't even all of them, but a lot of the um, open questions, the points on which expert opinion, you know, diverged in in, in terms of this case. this is important to, like, set down the foundation of, like, what we're looking at here as a mystery. So, you know, like, last time I said this case, it's kind of like a... A, a, a family or a, a solar system of mysteries in and of itself, right? The, these are kind of like the planets in, in that solar system, right? Okay, okay, I like that. I like that that's, analogy. That's my that's my analogy. We're here for it. Thank you. I'm a nerdy space person, um, which I'll, I'll talk about a good shit in the news today. <laughs> so um, whether Jean Benet had been sexually abused prior to her murder, which okay. we mentioned earlier, and there's definitely a case um, to be made one way or the other. Um, not not entirely clear, although, of course, as you said, the sexual abuse proximate to the murder itself is, is sort of undeniable. Um, whether the house was even broken into, because as you recall, the window, which was broken in the room where they found Jean Benet's body, yeah. right? Yeah. John had claimed to have broken it to get into the house weeks earlier and just never fixed it. Although it was also said that no one could get into that window because it was too small. But then, and yet an investigator was able to do just that I was, on TV. I was actually surprised when I saw that video. I was actually surprised at how big it was. And how and easy how, it was. And how somebody could have said it was too small in the first place. Right? And it, it clearly could have been a point of entry. So, like, that, that for me you know, definitely bolstered, yeah, the the intruder theory, or yeah. at least the, the plausibility of the intruder theory. Um, another point of contention was, um, you know, whether or not there should have been footprints outside in the snow. It said that, you know, the um, initial p- uh, police le- leaks, rather, stated that no footprints were found outside where there should have been. And yet there was video, crime scene video taken that showed that there really wasn't an accumulation of snow outside the house. So oh yeah, there was, was no another... snow in which footprints could have been made. Exactly. There was a lot of misinformation just in general following that case. Right, right. Um, was there danger to other children in the neighborhood? You know, this was a big point of contention at the time. And we'll get into the different theories of the case and suspects um, late, later on in the episode. Who wrote the ransom note, Right. Was it Patsy? Oh, as you know, there's some indication it was. Uh, there's this um, in- investigator, you know, handwriting expert, so called. Although I think handwriting analysis is is very flawed, uh, to say the least. I think some of it makes sense and some of it doesn't. But it's 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 intuitive rather than being scientific. I think that's right. the issue. It's a forensic field in which um, good scientific police work is kind of not possible. Uh, it's, 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 it's too speculative, I think. 
Not to mention the fact that, of course, the ransom note may have been intentionally masked, which they're trained to look for, including perhaps by using the offhand, which I thought was interesting. They think the, this person may have Wait, used their left me. hand instead of their right oh, hand, oh, their non-dominant hand, oh, to, like to on mask purpose? on purpose to mask their handwriting. So that's that's another kind of theory that I heard in terms of um, the the note. But but again, it's just like every single piece of these of evidence always sparks all these different controversies. Um, was the cause of death asphyxiation or blunt force trauma to the head? Mm. That's a big, big one. And there is good, you know, for forensic evidence showing that the um, blunt force trauma occurred while Jean Monnet was still alive. Yes, that's another theory based on she might have been hit in the head as an accident. What exactly? So that 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 and and I I definitely have that in my write up later on as well. The the accident theory, um, but in terms of like asphyxiation being the proximate cause of death or blunt force trauma to the head being the proximate cause of death, I think it's it's much more likely that the the blunt force trauma happened uh, after the asphyxiation. Um, that you know the, the asphyxiation was occurring, and it was mm. it was like slowly you know ratcheted. Yeah. Um, and apparently, there's the these things called the vagus nerves. This was all in the in the audiobook that uh, you know Cyril Wecht, you know, kind of explaining all this basically. Um, that as the uh, garrote would have been slowly tightened, um, there there would have come a point where the vagus nerves would have been uh, constricted to such a, a degree that the body would have just gone limp and the heart kind of would have stopped working, kind of like all of a sudden. Yeah. And the the abuser who may or may not have intended to kill Jean Monnet while constricting her her neck, which is another question which in is, of itself. Exactly, <laughs> which is another big the straight question. Straight up motive here. W was it an intentional murder? A lot of people think it was not an intentional murder, one way or the other. And then the blunt force trauma could have been out of frustration or out of an attempt to to mask the true cause of death at that mm -hmm. point. Um, which is another thing we always have to keep in mind. Is any of these things, you know, sort of an attempt to throw off the investigation? And and how do we interpret it um, there, therefore? So, um, yeah, was the, the death intentional? We had just talked about that. Um, was Jean Benet awake or not when the Ramses got home? That's another big one, you know. They, um, okay, wait, wait. They said that she wasn't, right? Right, right, that she was asleep in the car and they you know, brought her up to bed. But obviously at some point in the night... that She was up because of the pineapple. The pineapple, whether that was her, you know, when she was coming home and they lied about it or whether someone brought her down later but and kind of fed her this pineapple like or whether she did it herself. Like I it's, think that's the most it's, puzzling pieces of this case. The pineapple is definitely a, a wedge in the uh -huh. whole, in like so many questions and so many things that the Ramsey said, but also what the DA, both the DA and the police were looking at. It just didn't make any sense. Right. J just like, you know, the, the notion that an intruder, you know, would be kidnapper would sit at the table and write out a ransom note two and a half pages long inside of the home. Right. You know, it, that also doesn't make, you know, it seem to make much sense, right? Um, cool. So, the, uh, like I said, there's other stuff, obviously, in contention, but that that's kind of the main list from my perspective. So okay. now we're going to talk about some of the yeah, investigators. Yeah, we're going to talk about who's who in the investigation. Yes. So I want to talk about Lou Smith. Please do. So the DA brought him in. He also had a huge influence on this case in general. Mm -hmm. The DA brought him in about three months um, exactly. into the investigation. So part of the appeal for him was that he had a very successful conviction rate and they had a lot of confidence 90 plus in percent. Him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of confidence put onto this guy. He was old school and they liked that he followed the evidence. He was trustworthy in that way. Mm -hmm. So he's the one that found the broken basement window and he concluded that it was too small for someone to fit through, but Lou was the one that proved it wrong and actually didn't. Exactly. Her. So he also found the blue suitcase that was up against the wall. I didn't even talk about the blue suitcase. Right. So according to the housekeeper, the housekeeper was like, that's usually not 
down there. Right. So that also kind of pushes the intruder theory in that the person used it to get in or get out as like a stepping stool. That's what I was looking at it. And wasn't there kind of like a print on it that they found or something or like a shoe print? They found shoe prints. I don't think they found it on the suitcase. I think they found it either outside or in like dust in the the basement. On the wall. Wasn't there There kind of like a... There was like a mark on the wall. There was a straight line. Where somebody like kind of like could have like slid down. Yeah, 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 something like that. And then the high tech shoe print was the one that was found inside of the basement, right? Yeah, so the footprint was a partial footprint in the cement near where the body was found from a high-tech brand boot. Right, which did not match any shoe Right, no one in the the house house had that type boot. Right, 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 right. After analyzing the autopsy photos, he's the one who determined that abrasions were from the stun gun. And I thought that was very interesting and something else that nobody really touched on. He was the only one. However, it made a lot of sense after they went and tested it. They tested it on a hog and they were the same. The marks were the same. But it's still... It's speculative. It's still speculative. Yeah, no um, one really knows what... And that's another one, actually. Again, another piece of evidence that there's a lot of disagreement on. There were these two sets of marks, one on her neck and one, um, I can't remember, like on her torso or something. Yes. um, That people say are a stun gun. But other people think it might be something else. Could be something else. Yeah. Um, So here's his theory. He kind of has a working theory. So Mm -hmm. while the Ramseys were at their friend's Christmas party... The intruder broke into the house, wrote the note, and waited. He thinks that the intruder entered John Bonet's room, subdued her with the stun gun, then carried her down to the basement. So he was going the the plan for this intruder was to put her body in the blue suitcase, but it didn't fit, and then it wouldn't fit out the window. So he sexually assaults her, kills her with a blunt object, and leaves. Her fame in the pageant community is the target, is the motive. That's what his idea was. Mm -hmm. Um, He also noted that the underwear had a mixture of DNA, hers, and a part of someone else's. That was also a big push towards the... um, The intruder theory. Intruder theory. And he also made a spreadsheet of the suspects, which is also another point in in this mystery. It's also another Mm -hmm. question that are there names on there that are possibly, you know, the, the killer. We don't know. Because if I recall, he has about 45 names on the list. Something like that. And so yeah. I believe they said they have, some of them have not been ruled out by investigators. Right, right. And he was working on it until the day he died. Yeah, he. I wanted to mention that he uh, was in hospice care for uh, uh, cancer. Yes. And I believe they said he was there for like 15 days and like 12 of those days he was working on the Jean Benet Ramsey case. I mean, dedication. He was really dedicated to it, even though he resigned from the case because of the ridicule. Right. Was it the ridicule? Or? No, he resigned from the case because the police thought that it was the Ramseys and he didn't. Oh, and he didn't want to be the, a part of that. Yeah. Possibly putting someone in a exactly. in jail. Right. Exactly. He, he felt that there was a chance that his gravitas and his... Um, investigation was going to get exactly used to to put an innocent person in jail. Um, and then I was going to talk a little bit about Dan Crane. Okay. Uh, who was a, a DNA expert brought in l- later on, right, um, in 2008. Oh, wow. And this is where, you know, um, the DNA technology was advancing, right? So they were going to do a reexamination of the evidence in, in light of the new technique called, as we've mentioned, touch, touch DNA. DNA. Yes, yes, yes. We'll, get, so, we'll talk about more later. Well, you will, because well, you know way more about it than I do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I was actually going to talk about it. I mean, I can talk about it now, too. Do it. Um, so there's kind of this controversy about touch DNA because it, it is incredibly sensitive, um, or I believe, if, if, I'm, if I recall correctly, orders of magnitude more sensitive than just normal DNA analysis. So it's able to essentially create a profile from a smaller sample than would otherwise normally um, be able to be done. The issue with this is that, one, the sample may be kind of in, inherently... Um, 
unreliable because of how small it is. So you may feel that you're getting a profile when one doesn't actually exist um, in, in a way that's, like, really robust uh, enough to, like, really say for sure, like, it is this person and to the exclusion of all other people. And even if it was, we still have the question of how it got there. Exactly. It could have gotten there in any number of ways with this type of... And there, analysis, right? There have actually, yes, exactly. Um, separately, maybe two years ago, I can't remember, I recall hearing a, a, a detailed story about this, so I think on NPR or BBC, uh, about experiments being done with touch DNA to show that uh, a, a piece of, like my DNA, for example, could end up on a person that I've never met before. Or yeah, in a place I've guys, never been. Like, bumped up in the subway. Exactly, or something like that. and it can. It, and and what they proved also was that DNA can be transferred from a person to a surface to another person to another surface. That's really interesting and right. also extremely problematic. <laughs> yes. So, yes, even even if you know somebody's DNA were found um, to match what's on Jean Monnet's, you know. The, the panties, for example, or the long johns, right, there's no guarantee that that person ever came into physical contact with those objects. Right. Um, so there's an inherent issue with touch DNA in, in that it, um, yeah, it we can't be safe for sure that the, the scenario that you think actually occurred in terms of how it got there is actually how it happened. Mm-hmm. So we will, we, you know, it's just, it's, it's a very mysterious, it, it creates more mystery than it solves. Yes. A lot of time, but I think a lot of the time. Yeah. But because it's DNA evidence, it's seen People as, People are automatically you know, like, right. They, end they, all they, be all. They gloss over all that nuance. You know, it never, that never really comes up. Um, but for Dan Crane, even though he is a DNA expert, he, which I appreciate, is all about those nuances and, and putting it in the correct perspective. And he actually said, you know, just bluntly, that DNA evidence cannot absolutely exclude anyone or definitively say whether the killer came from in or out of the home. So, like, this whole notion that we're going to look to DNA evidence to solve this crime – and to tell us was it intru- an intruder or not an intruder, we don't it ain't. Ne- it's never going to happen. It's not, not Sorry. certain. Sorry, and it's it's disappointing. It is because that's <laughs> our best hope moving forward, right? I mean, DNA analysis gets better. That's that's you know, it's uh, a way to look at old evidence in a new light. But um, it's just unfortunately never going to be the the key to this crime, uh, probably, unless we get new DNA evidence. But um, with what we have right now, it's it's just probably not going to be that. Um, and yeah, that that was kind of the main takeaway I had from uh, from Mister Dan Crane. And then I was just going to briefly mention one other investigator, uh, the police chief Mark Beckner, who yeah. strongly believed that John and or Patsy were involved in yeah. this. He was definitely a main advocator for their guilt, right? And, and made sure that other people felt that way. And the people who didn't feel that way, they weren't in on they weren't in on the case, right? And that's just right. how it happened. Unfortunately, that happened in the DA's office too, the opposite way. Yeah, which is again where yeah. this intruder theory this, for them. this polarization, you know, kind of developed more and more. But no, you're exactly right. The dictum came from on high, basically, right. and it's also why I mean we can never really, even if we did have someone we can never really put them on trial because the DA and the police can't agree. They can't work together. They can't really bring anything concrete where they both agree on it and they both want to move forward. It's just something that wasn't going to happen at the time. Or for the 22 years since then. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, no, definitely. Um, Beckner, Chief Beckner, also disputed the DNA evidence, especially the touch DNA evidence. You know, partly, you know, again, like we said, because it tends to... um, support the intruder theory, which he did not agree with. Again, confirmation bias. Um, he seemed to have, to have had a, a, a bad case of it. Um, over the course of the investigation, though, you know, literally hundreds um, or one could even really say thousands of other investigators have been involved in this case, whether that's, you know, private investigators, 
uh, officers, detectives, medical examiners. Oh, right, right. You know, at, so at, the, at the local, the state, the federal level, um, internet – and then if, if you include like the internet sleuths. I think that's where you can get to like the thousands of people because there are people on the internet who devote, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours to this and trying to solve this case. Um, it's just incredible. You know, again, go look at the encyclopedia. Uh, a lot of them are mentioned oh, on there. yeah, yeah. And when I say the encyclopedia, of course, the JonBenet Ramsey case encyclopedia uh, that we mentioned in the last episode. So let's kind of get, get back to the investigation itself and kind of a, a broad outline of the timeline of the investigation. Excuse me, just very, very broadly. Hun- hundreds of uh, suspects, about 200 eventually, were interviewed or examined by the police and the DA. Um, but none of them was definitively, you know, said like, okay, this is the person we can charge. Um, many local um, known sex offenders and or pedophiles were looked at, of course, um, other people looked at were part of the Ramsey family, John and Patsy, you know, obviously from the police's perspective, um, or the friends acquaintances of the Ramseys. And, um, you know, even though there were this, you know, kind of plethora of, um, suspects, the DA, Alex Hunter and the police, like we were just talking about delayed bringing charges, um, because, you know, they yeah, just basically they, didn't feel like they could, they, they could prove an actual case. Yeah, they didn't want to put something out there that they couldn't win, and they didn't think it was strong enough. And again, like right. we talked about earlier, they were about being right than putting out the the truth. Exactly. And this was also in a couple, I, I read a little more on this grand jury thing. Right. So it leaked in 2013 that there was a grand jury put together and that based on the evidence, they decided that they would have indicted the Ramses. Exactly. However... Back in 1999. Right. How... Um, what does that say? On um, um, returning four charges. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, Two each against John and Patsy. Right. So, but the DA never really said anything about this. They never put that out there and it was a big story however mm-hmm. many years later when this came out um so that's where the whole weird relationship between the DA and the uh the police come in you know it's this whole thing of mistrust and miscommunication and there's no moving forward really yeah they just had their preset ideas of how the case was supposed to go and that's how it was going to go um, to the point where, you know, did the, the district attorney, Mary Lacey, uh, who followed Alex Hunter, she was actually the one of the deputy chiefs uh, under um, uh, D.A. Hunter. She famously sent a letter exonerating the Ramses. Right. right on, on, like an apology, right? Including an apology, exactly, on July 9th, 2008. Yeah. Um, she said that John Patsy Burke, it <sighs> absolutely could not have been any of I them. I forgot about that. And that they were completely exonerated. The, I read a really interesting article, mainly today when we were at Denny's, about. Ah, Denny's. Ah, uh, Denny's, yes. <laughs> um, how our favorite restaurant. About how. Um, her conclusion was based on a flawed test, a flawed DNA test. Again, DNA, not, you know, it's not perfect. Um, The test on which she based her conclusion used a limited number of what are called correlation points, right? So, you know, forensics, right, we're usually looking at two samples. Does this sample match this sample, right, right? They used only 10 of these correlation points instead of the standard 13 at okay, the time. Okay, okay. And the, 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 the testing kit that they used actually could have gone to as many as 16, but they, for whatever reason, neglected to do that. Once they got the result that Mary Lacey wanted, they declined to ask for any retesting to confirm that, um, that test. So... 
essentially this is that confirmation bias again. The testing site knows what the tester wants to be the outcome. Once they get that, everything's copacetic and they all go on their merry way, right? Um, not the way that a real investigation is supposed to go, not how science is supposed to work. Uh, and then over, you know, the 20 plus years that this cold case has, you know, been around, um, many, many theories of the case have, have arisen. And I think, you know, let's get into a little bit of, uh, of some of those theories of the case now. Okay. So, the John Ramsey case encyclopedia, uh, Jean Benet Ramsey, excuse me, case uh, encyclopedia, identifies seven distinct theories of the case. Yes, yes, yes. And I'm just going to kind of run through those. So, neutral, non committal, intruder did it, Ramsey's did it, John, John did, did it, it. Patsy, Patsy did, it. did it, Burke did Burke. it, and William Ramsey did which it. Which doesn't make which sense. We're not even going to mention that one because it really doesn't make any sense. And so, William Ramsey is the oldest brother that they were going to visit. He wasn't even in the state, right? He's that's in my Michigan, understanding. He right? was in Michigan, so yeah. I don't know. Anyway, it was on there, so I, I just wanted to say. It. Okay, so basically the theories of the case break into two categories. The family was involved or the family was not involved. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And we'll kind of look big, at each of those. big, big question. Yes, yes. It's, so, this is kind of the big mystery as to it. So we should go through the fam the family theories right. first. And I think a big question is, well, it is always like that, is um, can parents kill their children? Obviously the answer is yes. But can we apply that same kind of um, maliciousness to Patsy and John Ramsey, which is a whole other type of, you know, analyzation that we could get into, but you know. And it's this question of how are people supposed to act, right? Right, right. That is a huge thing with this case. And I think... Not only... Oh, sorry, go on. I, th I don't know. I've always thought that you don't know how you're going to react when you, when you find your dead child. But it goes both ways, I think. Because this, this was the point I wanted to make. It goes both ways. Because, yes, you you can't pigeonhole someone in terms of their legitimate reaction to them tragically finding out their children are dead, right? But you also can't necessarily pigeonhole what a person who could potentially kill their child would act like, right? Yeah. Because people say, oh, you know, John and Patsy, they didn't fit the profile of a, of a child killer. They, they, you know, were these, you know, benevolent, um, giving, uh, you know, God-fearing people. Perfect on paper. Family. Sure, you know, they, they were this glossy you know, picture of a family. Um, they were the you know, fucking poster child, poster children for Christmas in Boulder. Yeah. You know, whatever, <laughs> 1990. Welcome to our home. Five, you know. Um, but, again, it, it, it cuts both ways. Neither can we say because they didn't grieve correctly, they're guilty. By the same token, we can't say because they're good people, they couldn't have committed this heinous crime. Right. So I kind of want to talk about a case that is similar to the John Bonet Ramsey case. Sure. Where the mother was found guilty and sentenced to 18 years in prison. Okay, so what case was that? So this happened in uh, uh, 2010. Zara Baker, she was 10, and this is in uh, Hickory, uh, North Carolina. I've been there. So, oh, really? It's near, near Charlotte. So there is a 911 call in this case. It was made by um, Eliza, or mm, it could be Eliza, Elisa, I'm going to say Eliza, on October 9th, 2010 at 5.30 a.m. reporting a fire in the back of the family residence. So when the police came, they, for, for the fire, there was a ransom note and the smell of gasoline coming from uh, the husband's company truck, which was a Chevy Tahoe. In the second 911 phone call made when the daughter uh, was reported missing at 2 p.m. the same day, uh, the father explained that there was a fire in their backyard and that a million-dollar ransom note was found on his company truck the night before, addressed to him, uh, addressed to his boss and landlord, Mark 
coffee. So he explained that they called 911 earlier that day about the fire and then implied that whoever started the fire may have done this to distract the family and that they that's where that's when our daughter was taken and this that and the other thing. So the aunt named Fuzzy Winkler <laughs> told reporters that um, Eliza told her that Zara died after being sick for two weeks and that both parents dismembered her and hid the remains. Her aunt said, quote, she'd been sick two weeks before she died. When they found her, I guess they didn't know what to do. They just went wild. And then a year later, in September 2011, the stepmother, Eliza Baker, pleaded guilty to murdering Zara and was sentenced to 18 years in prison. Oh, my God. Yeah. So this... It's Some, a plausible yeah. theory. It's a plausible theory. Sometimes you act weird because... You're guilty. Because you're guilty. Right, right. But it's that question of what does acting weird mean? I mean, the fact that they retain counsel so quickly, that's a big thing that people point to, that they retain separate counsel. But, you know, mm, now they say, okay, you know, John Bynum said this is what we should do. He basically, like, set it up and whatever. And it's a a rich, whatever rich people thing. I don't know. But. Lawyers. Give me my lawyers. Right. Um, but there, there are a lot of, you know, ideas as to why the Ramses may have done this. Um, and l- let me just kind of run through a, l- yeah. a list of those as well. So motives, the possible motives for the Ramses. Exactly. That's, that's what we'll title this list. Um, this is one that was most, um, most, uh, popular with the Boulder PD was the bedwetting rage theory. Mm. Now this is a, a theory in which we posit that, uh, Jean Monnet was having a particular issue with bedwetting, you know, over and above what a normal child, I suppose, would experience, right? Um, and that this put Patsy into such a rage that she, you know, perhaps accidentally um, killed Jean Monnet with a blow to the head and the other, you know, parts of the crime, right, were a setup, were, were right? set up to, to, to mask this. That's the basic idea of this, and th- this is kind of the main, I think, theory of the Boulder PD. There's the marital rage theory, uh, or the John caught in the act mm. theory, mm-hmm. um, which are similar. Um, these posit that uh, John Ramsey was sexually abusing Jean Monnet uh, on an ongoing basis, which, probably. I don't think that's true. And that um, that uh, he was, you know, caught out by. Um, by Patsy that night, and that in the ensuing melee or whatever, Jean Monnet ended up dead. And again, everything else was a setup. Same kind of thing, except except sexually abuse by Patsy. So there's also that theory that it was Patsy who was Which sexually abusing Jean Monnet. It's pretty rare. It is much rarer for women to be um, guilty of sexual abuse, but it does happen. It, it definitely has happened. There's the Munchausen by proxy syndrome theory. What? Wait, I've never heard of that one. The, the, exactly. The, there's there's a, a theory of the case that this may have been an example of Munchausen by proxy in which one inflicts, um, you know, pain or... or, or For sympathy, right? You know, to, to, ga- to gain sympathy, exactly. So the idea here would be that Patsy and or John um, set this up and and murdered Jean Monnet in order to get the sympathy that they would get from being the grieving parents that's, of a dead child. That's pretty extreme. It it is. All all of these are fairly extreme. Um, there's the chi- child pornography ring theory. That's also extreme. Right. That but and not there's no ev- there's but there's really no evidence of it in this case. I mean, yeah. they did uh, extensive searches for child pornography in the Ramsey's home, and 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 nothing was ever found. That's another tabloid piece of information that there was child porn right. found, but that's there not never, true exactly, at all. Exactly. There never not was. At all. There never was. And then a, a, a nice ritual sacrifice theory. No. You know, just because, why not? Got to have that in there. Because uh, it's the it 90s. Was the it, it was the satanic panic era, so that's always got to always gotta be in there, I think. So, you know, all of these, um, you know, theories, you know, kind of, again, don't have too much evidence in support of them, but... Except their reactions, right? Yeah, but nor could they exactly be, you know, ruled out um, because of kind of the the dearth of evidence, right? So um, what also kind of didn't work in the Ramsey's favor was this CNN interview they did 
which we we right. have probably mentioned before on New Year's Day, nineteen ninety seven. Actually, ex- exactly twenty one years ago from from today, um, a week after their child had died, um, this interview did not do them any favors and and really put a lot more suspicion on them. Now it should be noted that especially Patsy Ramsey was l- like literally tranquilized, like she was taking whatever you know mm. um, pills you know to, and that may have been part of why she appeared so kind of bizarrely in the interview and, and like detached. And I mean, she like broke down at different points, but both she and John, it, it was, it was, it was kind of strange. Um, so the police centered mainly on Patsy thinking that she did it. And then John helped her to cover it up. Yeah. Well, they're kind of trying to cover their tracks with that interview. That's kind of what it seems like. Right. And I don't know. when were they officially interviewed? Wasn't it like weeks later? It was about later? four months after yeah. the, the crime occurred. Yeah. Why? Yeah. They, there's, <laughs> so they say many one questions. thing, the, you know, the police say something else. It, you know, they, they just kept saying, you know, Patsy especially kept saying, like, why are you talking to us? Like, go go find the real killers. But it's like, well, but don't you understand that we have to rule you out first, you know, before we can do that. Um, it didn't really make, you know, make too much sense. Um, but yeah, you know, John, Patsy, even Burke, they have plausible motives. They have obviously access. Um, the murder weapons were from within the home. So they, you know, had the, the, the ability to gain access to those as well. So was the ransom note, the pen and paper from the ransom note. The pen and paper. Within the home. Almost all of the physical evidence in this case came from within the home, which does tend to point away from the intruder theory. The little physical evidence that there is. Right. And like we mentioned, it's also been suggested that, you know, one or more of the Ramseys, including perhaps Burke, accidentally killed Jean Monnet. And then it was kind of set up, you know, the note, et cetera, to, um, to cover that up. So I don't know if you remember, if you ever watched the terrible, terrible Netflix special, Casting John Bonet. I did not. Boring. It was bad. I thought it would be Didn't a hear good documentary about, about the case. But right. It's just I don't. I was. I wasn't really clear on the concept, but it was just a ton of actors auditioning for the part of John to play Bonet. of John Bonet, right. Patsy, John, and Burke. And they also talked about their experience with it and how they felt when they heard it. Blah blah. blah. Uh-huh. But there was a part where they had. Like the actors who could who could possibly play Burke, smash a watermelon with a bat to show that it's possible that a little kid could do this. Oh my god! Pretty freaking brutal. I mean, talk about like sensationalizing and like, oh like why is that? That's that's gratuitous. Like that's not necessary. I mean, I think we all realize that. You know, a nine-year-old boy is capable of killing a six-year-old girl. Like, yeah. has that's happened m- many times throughout, you know, modern criminal history in which one child kills another child. Clearly, you don't need some kind of fucking demonstration in order to know that. Like, I don't, I don't really understand that. But again, you know, it should be said, no evidence has ever surfaced that really tied Burke to the crime. Right, right. So it's like, how and can again, we really suspect didn't... him that heavily if... There's nothing to point that he was even involved. Again, he didn't even really know she was dead, right? I mean, to, for, that's all indications point to that. Yeah. Sure. But what's funny, Mario. What? In our intro, in our little theme song, we say, the brother did it. That's what I thought, too. It's kind of obvious, right? But it's not obvious. We've changed our thinking on this case, for sure. And for we'll, sure. We'll, we'll get into that kind of at the end. Um, okay, so now that we've kind of, like, talked through the, the family angle, let's get into some of the, the intruder, intruder theories. theories. Yes. So Mario and I gathered a list of, su- there's many, many, many suspects, but we kind of looked at the ones that intrigued us the most and the ones that have the most information on them. So let's first talk about Gary. Gary o- Oliva? Oliva. Oliva, right? So. Not a good dude. He's ugly as fuck, first of all, number on, one. On the outside and the inside. On the outside and the inside. He is a convicted 
um, pedophile True. and sexual predator. He had a vi- he had a violent past, and he he lived nearby. He was he lived in the in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And what's weird about him was that he was picked up, and then they found a stun gun in his in his backpack. Right. right? This is in the year two thousand on in, the Boulder campus. Right in or the University of Boulder campus. Right. So. Uh, he served time in prison for attempting to strangle his mother with a telephone cord. He was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. Like, like, like we said, he was hanging around the Boulder area. He's someone who knows the neighborhood. He was homeless at the time. He hung around at the church down the street from the Ramsey house. He um, also had literally he had a, a shrine, shrine right? to Jean Benet. And he talked about how he loved her. No, I would never hurt her. I love her. I he would, loved John Benet. He would cut out her picture from, like, pictures from the internet and put it on, on um, Monopoly money. Oh, I didn't hear about that. Ew. Yeah. And then he would, like, place it, like, on his shrine. Fucking creepy. Makes your fucking skin crawl. Oh, my God. Yeah. He was like, yeah, I loved Oh, I could never hurt her. I loved her. He Ugh. was also found with a, a poem about Jean Benet on him, as Ew. well as the stun gun when, when he was picked up in 2000. Yeah. He did take a handwriting and saliva sample, but they could never put him at the scene of the crime. That was the problem with right. Gary. He didn't match the two, you know, P, the DNA evidence that they always point to, right, on the, the panties and the, the long johns. He didn't match it. So... If there was an intruder, I like the chances of Michael Helgoff. Okay. So he was 26, a owned a junkyard. He was dis- the the reason he was um put on the list in the first place that he was discovered dead with dead with a gunshot wound and they said it was suicide. Right. Valentine's Day 1997. Right. So um this is from the A&E uh, special, which pushed the intruder theory very, very heavily. Yes. But they had a conversation with his friend John Kennedy talking about how him and his uh, uh, Michael and his partner, they're going to go make a deal on Christmas and they're going to make like fifty to sixty thousand dollars. But for some reason, he he never got that money. He also had a history of of. Um, Assault and mm-hmm. torturing animals. He was mm-hmm. possibly um, uh, a pedophile. Right. Uh, possibly sexually assaulted his girlfriend's daughter. Uh, he told her that he like couldn't trust himself with her. Um, apparently, he yeah he said a lot of weird things to John. Like I wonder what it would be like to crack a human skull and shit like that. So Michael was definitely a weird a weird guy. Yeah, he seems to fit the profile in in a way that I think a lot of people would uh would 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 um yeah find satisfying yes. to point to him as a suspect. In his room, high tech boots and a stun gun were found. Although the high tech boots They said they didn't match the prints. Did not match the prints, which right. is odd. They were not the same make the as name, the shoe. The same prints. type, yeah. yeah. Um so they also found a pillow with a bullet hole. Right. Did he home. did he actually commit suicide? Did he, yeah, that's, that's another a, question. That's another one mystery within this mystery. And he lived alone. So why would he care who heard the shot? Plus the gunshot came from the left. Right, and he was right-handed. And it was also a trajectory that suggested that it was not self-inflicted. Because it was still lodged in his head. Right, so the bullet was still lodged in his head. There's definitely definite questions as to whether or not he may have been murdered by someone. But again, possibly his partner, you know, Kumi mentioned to his friend John. Yeah, yeah, but again, the DNA didn't put him there. They couldn't really, right? Put, they didn't really have any other evidence, any right? Concrete, and that's a lot. That's mostly what the the intruders are. There's no like concrete evidence against them like anything that could right we have this we can totally bring him to trial now but there's none of that it's all circumstantial which is probably partly because of the blunders that were made oh, again at God. the B. it always it's comes all, back to it that, always right? comes back to that Wait, if you fuck up the day the the first day the first hours of the investigation it just it seeps into everything else okay so one other um, intruder theory that uh, we're going to talk about is uh, the guy that I, I call the false confessor, John Mark Carr, a.k.a. Ew. Um One of the most, yeah. yes, re- rep- reprehensible and disgusting uh, figures in, in this 
uh, sordid tragedy. So there's a lot on him. Yes, Let's I get into it. There's quite quite a bit on on John Mark Carr. So in August uh, of 2006, John Mark Carr is arrested in Thailand. Um, reportedly, he is a pedophile who abused the children whom he taught, uh, including in Thailand. Uh, he was convicted in 2001 for five counts of child pornography. So he does have child pornography connected to him. Um, he contacted, and this is, it's so strange. It's so fucking weird. Yeah. He contacted this guy named Michael Tracy, who's a documentarian uh, and a journalism professor um, there at the, the University of Colorado Boulder, I believe. Um, John Mark Carr said that he wanted to get in contact with Michael Tracy to basically be a conduit to Patsy Ramsey. And initially, Tracy just corresponded with um, this person who called himself Daxus, who we found out later was John Mark Carr, to see what uh, would happen. Um, he'd had some weird people contact him before. Mm-hmm. You know, he this he thought this was okay, just another weirdo. Some other guy, yeah. I'll, I'll look into it a little bit, right? But he's um, just so... Eventually, Daxus reveals himself to be both a pedophile and also intensely obsessed with the Jean Monnet Ramsey case to a level where he knew specific details of the case that Tracy thought that, that only uh, like he yeah. and the investigators knew but, and maybe the perpetrator. But then again, there's so much out there on this case. And when right. was he, when did this all start? This was in the mid two thousands. Well, so, it started in, you know, um, a little earlier, but yeah. But still like there's at that point, there's so much media coverage, so exactly. many articles. You can learn so much about it. Like, right. So Tracy, though, begins to suspect him when Daxus literally confesses to the crime, right? He tells Tracy that Jean Benet died accidentally during a sexual assault and that he wanted to, Daxus, uh, John Marcar, wanted to reassure the Ramses, especially Patsy, you know, that um, in in his twisted mind, right, that Jean Benet had died sort of peacefully and that God. to put this out there so that the sp- suspicion would go away from the, yeah. the parents. Yeah. He peacefully, was like weird. He was like trying to help them somehow. Peacefully while I was raping her. Right. It's, it's, it's bizarre and, and ex- exceedingly fucked up. Um, but this is the way, you know, certain people think they, it, it, it becomes a, a very perverse kind of, Moral yeah. morality, right? That that seeps into it. So he was put more into the spotlight once he called uh, the actual DA's office, right? Well, the um, or was it the other the, way the, around? Did the journalism in? professor Michael Tracy called the DA's office. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, he contacted DA Mary Lacey at that point, um, and the the police uh, attempted to trace a call back to Daxus. So at this point, he and um, Tracy are, are corresponding on the telephone as well because Tracy had set it up to try to, to catch him, yeah. essentially. Yeah. And with Tracy as the go-between, uh, Carr essentially uh, confesses on tape over the phone to Tracy. The police get that on tape. They also get a trace back to Bangkok, Thailand. So they find out, okay, yes. now Daxus is this guy, John uh, Mark Carr, who lives in uh, Bangkok right now. And... He's picked up in Bangkok. So now we're back August 16th, 2006. Like, why was he there again? He was trying to, like, escape some kind of accusation or something. Well, accusations, like, yes. That, that were probably that, true. Right, from California. But also because Thailand is, you know, just um, f- a, a famous place to go f- for, you know, pedophiles. It's really? like, yeah. It's, like, famous for, like, child porn, child uh, prostitution and things like that. Oh, that's so fucked up. Yeah, yeah. It's that's really so sad. It's quite fucked up. So Carr is arrested and held in Thailand. He's then extradited to the U.S. Uh, he arrives in L.A. to a huge media sensation, yeah. um, just yeah. like everything in this fucking case. And his arrest does happen while Patsy was battling her second bout of uh, cancer. ovarian cancer, yeah. you know, to which she would eventually succumb in, in 2006. Carr's DNA, though, again, like we say with all these people, did not match what was found at the scene. So essentially, he was exclu- excluded by police. Um, and it's also not at all clear that he was even in Colorado at the time of the crime. Uh, it seems actually that he was probably out of the country 
when the crime itself occurred. So that's why I call him the false confessor, because it seems pretty clear that however much he fits the profile and, and, and definitely was capable of this crime, it seems clear that John Mark Carr was not the perpetrator. But then in the interview, he was like, you think I'm going to confess to something that'll put me to jail so, 30 years? So uh, I wanted to, yes, I wanted to talk, about, to talk this, about, <laughs> about this fucking interview. Oh my God. What the hell was this about? He, okay, it so John Mark like Carr. like a fucking circle jerk for ID. That's what it seemed like to me. I guess the, like, let's give this guy a The producer spotlight. figured like, I guess we'll, if he wants to talk, we'll let him talk. I mean, it's a good TV. I don't know. It, it, it was bizarre. Um, so this happened in 2016, of course, with the ID channel, um, where they do this interview with John Mark Carr, and he still claims that John Bonet died accidentally while he was sexually assaulting her. He essentially says this on camera, uh, although he does also say the thing where, like, I'm not going to confess to something. He now claims that another person was also at the scene but refuses to name who they were. This is a whole different thing that he's talking about now he's that's never delusional. come up before. He seems to suggest that this other person had to do with pageantry, but he won't say who it is. And he also claims, maybe most bizarrely, that he has now been castrated. So oh, he, yeah. he no longer suffers from whatever this thing where he's, you know, a pedophile. So that's what he says. Anyway, so that's John Mark Carr, not the perpetrator of this crime, although, you know, how, however much we would want oh him to be, God. right? Um, and he was he was Terrible. released and everything, you know, once they excluded him. Okay, so we've talked about the stranger intruder theories. Now let's talk about some of the friend and acquaintance intruder theories. So let's talk about Santa. Santa may have done this. When I, I don't think he did it. But when I first heard it, I was like, oh, he totally did it. Right. But he was, yeah, he was a family friend. They were very close to right. the the Ramseys. Bill McReynolds. Bill McReynolds. I forgot. Right. I didn't even freaking say his name. Yeah, Bill <laughs> McReynolds. He played Santa at the Christmas parties every year. Right. Both John Bonanzi and Burke absolutely adored him, especially John Bonet. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked about this last time with the gift. We did talk about him and, a little bit yeah, last yeah, time. Yeah. She gave him a gift. Um uh, John Ramsey noted that McReynolds pushed Patsy away at the funeral when she tried to hug him and that he was, like, desperate for media attention, but... And he was on the Today Show, but I don't really That was think weird. That was, that was weird. Because they didn't know he was going to be there or anything. He just randomly showed just up in there. the crowd. Yeah. And then started to, like, talking to Kitty Kirk or whatever. It was strange. Yeah. He had a special bond with her, and apparently, uh... She like took him on a personal tour of the home because right. she like as Santa really believed that he was the the real the real Santa right. And this is really the only thing that explains the pineapple. And he also reportedly gave her this weird note where he said something, oh, something special, special is going to happen to you after Christmas. Right. That to me is like the most indicative thing but it just like all of these things it's like not even totally clear if that's true so i don't know but he here's the big kicker dude was old he could not have gotten through that window he could not have walked up and down these stairs he could not have maybe if he could carry her it would be quite an effort uh he would have to keep her quiet like it's i i don't know and he had just had like heart lung surgery a few months prior so he wasn't really like up to snuff in the first place he was quite frail yeah yeah um his daughter and another friend had had been kidnapped one of them was molested molested and the perp was never found right and then his wife wrote that weird play oh yeah about a yeah about a girl who was tortured and murdered in her own basement right um and the crime was 22 years the date of John Bonet's murder. That's where I was getting the 22 years from. It was Bill McReynolds' daughter who was the victim 22 years before. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of weird stuff going on there. Yes. Very much so. Um, But uh, just like all these other ones, right, didn't match the DNA evidence. Exactly. They couldn't put him at the scene of the crime. He had an alibi. He was having dinner with his family, which was like a couple hours away Um, anyway. So. Yeah. So... 
couple of more of these possible friend suspects, uh, Linda Hoffman Pugh, who was actually that the, the Ramsey housekeeper, um, who we mentioned earlier. Um, her husband was the Ramsey's handyman. So she reportedly had asked the Ramseys for a loan um, just before this and was like really hard up for cash. And she possibly could have seen the $118,000 bonus for John, like the check. So that's where people think, okay, she she may have known about that part of it. And she had the kind of access to the home and Jean Monnet that one would have needed to do this, right? Uh, she had a key. She had complete access. Um, her DNA also did not match, though. And uh, she was not named as a suspect in court um, in any of the proceedings or or by the Ramseys, it should be said. Uh, she's not one of them, you know, because they, they – named a bunch of people, but she wasn't one of them. And the other one I was going to talk about is uh, Fleet White Jr., who you'll recall is the the husband of the couple where they were the night before, right? And Oh, um, oh, the Whites. Okay. Right, right, right. They live about four minutes away, and they're extremely close to the Ramseys, probably the closest friends of the Ramseys. They're in, in Boulder, and they, especially Fleet, had extraordinary access to the home. He had a key. Um, he had a standing invitation to come to the home, and he had an intimate knowledge of the Ramsey's home, including the basement, specifically the room in which Jean Monnet was found. He, he apparently was like familiar with that room. And he also was very close to Jean Monnet and therefore could have manipulated her into being quiet and into going with him, you know, the kind of means that one would need in order to perpetrate this crime. Um, There's also... You know, just because it's kind of out there, an unfounded accusation that he sexually abused a woman named Nancy Krebs when she was a child, along with White Jr.'s father and John Ramsey. But there are some inconsistencies in Nancy Krebs' story. It's not clear whether or not it's really plausible, um, but it is kind of out there. So there are more suspects. But those are kind of, the, I think, the main ones from our perspective. So, yeah, what what do we what do we think? What's our conclusion, dude? I have no idea. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> yeah, I used to be like, "Yo, parents did it all the way. Definitely accidental death cover up." But that's but how I this case goes, right? The more you look into it, the more fucking mysterious. The it more becomes. questions that come. Yeah, you can't. <clears throat> <sighs> because yes, we we <laughs> both my frustration sounds. We both used to be strong proponents of the Ramsey's theory of the yes. of the, the the family was involved theory. We both, I think, it can be fairly said, are now not sure. <laughs> we sure. we we are it at least I'm much more willing to entertain the intruder theory. Me too. It definitely could have been an intruder, but it also could have been the freaking Ramsey's. They could have done it themselves. Any any one of these theories of the case could be correct. And then, like I we think. said, it goes back to this bungled ass investigation, and that we'll never know. Exactly. I don't think this crime will ever be solved. I don't think so. But you know, the thing I take if, uh, away from it is that you know, just over and over and over again, when I've been researching this case, is how it haunts the people who study it and investigate it. You know how this case stays with you in a way that is unique yeah. in, in, in modern true crime history and and changed the whole trajectory of true crime culture. Yeah. Um, so I think that's kind of the big, you know, kind of takeaways from it that I would, um, yeah, that I would make. It, it's a seminal and there's so many, watershed case. There's so many branches, weird shit going on with it. There's right. so many weird twists and turns about suspects, about the Ramseys, about their past and the DA and, oh, my God, it's just everyone involved. Yeah, I mean, there's even a theory that the DA's office was trying to cover it up for them, that Alex Hunter was aware that, you know, Burke did it or Patsy did it. Um, but they didn't, de- you know, it was an accident, so they didn't deserve to go away. So, therefore, the DA's office was, like, basically complicit in a cover-up. We didn't even talk, we didn't even talk about that because it's not that plausible. But, you know, another theory. there's another theory, you know, there's so, so many. I mean, we, we decided to keep this right about an hour, which we're, we're right about, right about there now. Um, 
but we fuck. We could, we could talk about this case for hours. For real. For real. But uh, I think, I we'll, think we we'll did leave. a good job. Yeah, you know, we, we, we I gave it I was really the, worried about yeah. tackling this behemoth of a case, to be honest. It's a biggin. It's a biggin. A biggin. It's a biggin. It's a biggin. biggin. So, yeah, and I think we'll, for the next couple of weeks, probably try to to get into more thingy stuff. Um, you know, take, maybe stay take a little, a little break from this. But, yeah, stay tuned. Thanks so much for listening, you guys. Yes. Um, please follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook. Um, please subscribe. Give us a, a rating and um, on iTunes. That helps us a lot. Right. Um, if you really want to help us out, head over to Patreon. Achoo! Excuse me. Help us buy some <laughs> cough, cold medicine. We're, we're getting the sniffles here. Um, so, yeah, you know, just check us, check out our Insta and stuff. We, we're always putting stuff up on there. And uh, we're just really excited for another year of uh, MMT. Yay! You know, it's, yes, thank you for supporting us for a year. Yeah. It's been crazy. Yeah, seriously, but... if, we, if we weren't actually getting people to listen to this, I don't know if we would still be doing it. I mean, we love it. But it's it's so much cooler that, like, I go on my computer and I'm like, oh, so somebody in Australia listened today. Or, you know, we've, we have, like, ten listens from Amsterdam, New I York. Or Washington, Washington. Or Nanaimo, Canada. Yes. Or, like, there's so all these random you, people. I love it. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for being. Thank you for being a friend. Yes. Travel down the road and back again. What did you say yesterday? You're like, oh, Chloe, you're totally a Blanche. <laughs> <laughs> I think I asked you if you were. Yeah, at the party last night, yeah, uh, I was wearing my squad shirt, you know, Golden Girls squad shirt. And this guy was like, oh, yeah, I'm totally a, a Blanche. Uh, I thought it was funny. I'm a Dorothy. I think y'all probably would yeah. know that. Yeah. Hey, uh, e- email us and tell us which golden girl you are. You know, mystery murdery thing at gmail.com. Mystery murdery thingy at gmail.com. Are we going to do or weird any other shit thoughts in the you have? News? Oh, yeah. Let's weird just, just, shit just in real. News? I, I just want to do weird, re- shit, weird, shit, weird in shit in the news. Weird shit in the news. Alert, alert. Alert, alert. Danger, danger. Nerd alert. Will Robinson. Um, real big nerd alert here. My. I want to do like kind of a good shit in the news, right? Because uh, as we've been talking about all day, um, the New Horizons spacecraft um, just completed the furthest encounter that man has ever done with an uh, with a, with a, a celestial object. Yeah, uh, we we have just gone the furthest out in space we've ever been. Not quite. That's a different spacecraft, Voyager oh. Two, which is the furthest that that. But we went past Pluto, right? It went past Pluto. Exactly. This is the spacecraft that took all those amazing pictures of Pluto. You know, for the the heart of Pluto and stuff. Um, not only did it do that, but now three years later, it's also had an encounter with an object in the Kuiper Belt um, called Ultima Thule. Um, so this is a very small asteroid. It's about 35 kilometers by 15 kilometers. And, um, yeah, we're going to get the first pictures um, probably tomorrow, the the first, like, higher resolution pictures. But because it is so far away, it takes six and a half hours for the signal to reach us. Yeah. And it's going to take about two years for all of the data that was collected to be sent back to Earth. So... I have a lot to look forward to. I can't really fathom. <laughs> there are gigabytes of data, and it goes at about a, a thousand bits per second. So, yeah, it's going to be going for a while. Okay, so, but that's good mine. shit in the news, too. Awesome. So, this happened in uh, East Vincent Township in Pennsylvania. Um, a police standoff in Chester County oh. ended on Wednesday after a SWAT negotiation negotiator saying white Christmas. So there was this guy, Nathaniel Lewis. Uh, he barricaded himself inside his house. Uh, he was uh, a member of the National Guard and he had a rifle and he uh, allegedly opened fire at police during the the barricade and they uh, were at a standoff for nine hours. Oh, my God. And uh, Chester County District Attorney Tom Hogan says a SWAT negotiator eventually talked the man into surrendering nine hours later by singing White Christmas. It's the power of music. The, uh, right? The, the, Plato was right. The power, the power of music. Right. The district attorney bought Christmas cookies for the SWAT team members, too. Good. So... 
<laughs> Good start to the year. Good start to the year. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. Well, Happy New Year, y'all. Have a good one. You know, if you're part of the Orthodox Church, uh, Merry Christmas on January 7th, 7th apparently. Right. Uh, that's how that works, I guess. <laughs> okay, bye, y'all. Bye.